Well, good morning, everyone. Um, for those of you who haven't met me, I'm Robbie, a 2016 UK Nuffield Scholar. Um, and I'd first of all just like to thank Nuffield Australia for letting a POM share the stage. So thank you for that. And it is an honour to share the stage with um, my fellow Brazil GF uh, GFP team. So my topic is addressing the perceived failings of short-term land occupation. But just before I go into my topic in a little bit more detail, um, I just want to give you a bit of a background about our farm at home. As a family, uh, we farm in Lincolnshire, and that consists of my dad, aunt, uncle, and granddad. Uh, we farm approximately 850 hectares of combinable crops, so wheat, barley, oilseed, rape, um, and field beans as a bit of a break. Um, most farming businesses in the UK have had to diversify their income in one way or another, and we are no different to that. Um, this is our farm steading, as you can see on the slide behind me, and approximately 10 years ago, uh, we heavily diversified into plastic recycling, farm plastic recycling. Um, we have now got a network of franchises dotted around the UK, um, collecting farm plastic waste, bringing it back to our farm steading in Lincolnshire and producing products such as garden furniture, um, grain flooring or fencing posts. So going on to my Nuffield topic, um, addressing the perceived failings of short-term land tenure. Why did I do this? So a farmer has a huge weight of responsibility sitting on their shoulders. They are a food producer, a land manager, and a custodian. And getting that role equally balanced is a tough job. So out of the last 18 months, I traveled to seven different countries. I met with policy makers, legislative makers, funding providers, landowners, occupiers, um, land agents, professional advisors, and had some fantastic meetings. And yes, as a ginger Englishman traveling to some hot countries, I used at least five bottles of Factor 50 sun cream. <laughs> um, so I chose this topic for three main reasons. Uh, one, because of the land that we farm in Lincolnshire, approximately 28% of that land that we farm, we rent in on an annual basis. So we're issued with a new tenancy agreement for the same land every year. So we don't know guaranteed if we've got that land going forward. And we struggle heavily with black grass. Some of you may be aware of this, uh, but it's a huge problem, particularly in the east of England. This is a field of wheat smothered in black grass, and this was taken just before uh, harvest um, uh, earlier this year. Just to give you a bit of background, black grass can reduce your wheat yield by up to 50%. Before we harvest this crop, we had to spray the wheat off with Roundup just so that we could get the, um, uh, get the crop through the combine because obviously the grass wouldn't die off. It's resistant and it's a big problem. You need to think much more longer term if you're actually going to try and tackle this through varying your crop rotations. Second reason, as well as farming in Lincolnshire, I work as a rural practice surveyor, so I'm actively providing other landowners and occupiers with advice on varying types of landlord and tenant structures. And thirdly, because it's topical at the moment, in the UK we have various bodies such as the Tenant Farmers Association, which are actively lobbying for much longer term tenancy agreements. So, when I set out, I asked this very question to a lot of UK farmers and those abroad. And this word cloud gives you a summary of the answers which I received. The larger the word, the more often I received that answer. So you might be thinking at this time, what do I actually mean by short term? So just, just to provide a bit of background, the average length of a tenancy agreement in the UK that started after 95 for bare land is approximately three years. For a fixed holding, i.e. one that has a house or um, 
uh, farm buildings, the average length is over 10 years. And many of those that I asked as I was travelling around, you know, what do you class as a short-term um, occupation agreement? Many said, well, surely 15 years is still short term, 20 years, 30 years, especially if you are considering the three things that a uh, land a owner or a farmer has to take into account, being food producer, land manager, and custodian. So what have we got up here in the word cloud? We've got culture, relationships, and trust as being a big concern when you're looking at short-term agreements. Investment and business planning. If you only have a tenancy agreement or occupy land for a year, how much investment are you realistically going to put into that soil or building uh, your business and developing your business? High rents. In the UK, the average rent for prime arable land is in the region of £220 an acre, completely disproportionate to the related earning capacity. Soil health. By far the biggest answer that I received. The degradation of our soils and soil structure is increasingly coming under strain as businesses are looking for short-term gain in an era of increasing price volatility and uncertainty in the market. So as I set out, I went to Brazil, unbelievable country, and I met with Rogigo, who you can see here, bending down, holding in his hand what he deemed to be his number one um, or how he, how he, how he um, generated uh, success. It's a worm. He liked to be known as the worm farmer. That's how he measured his success of his business. He farmed with his brother, and uh, quite a few years ago, his, uh, the two of them went in their separate directions. His brother wanted to farm the soil more conventional methods, and Rogigo wanted to use more no-till methods because he valued significantly his business focusing on soil health, and that's how he deemed that he should be tackling that. He rented inland, but further down the line, other neighbours were actually approaching him to take their land on, on longer-term tenancies, 10, 15 years, because they know that he was focusing on soil health. And he wasn't paying the highest rents, but they had, he had the heart of the soil at uh, the centre of his mind. Brazil taught me that they focus on soil health and their environment. Out of all the land outside of the Amazon region, region unbeknown to me before I arrived, at least 20% of any land holding has to be put aside for conservation measures. You're only allowed to actually physically farm 80% of the holding. We can see there integrated cropping. This was melons being farmed alongside onions. Again, focusing on soil health. Investment and business planning. I visited one farm that had put in 22 pivot irrigators within the last three years. Each pivot irrigator was 100 hectares in size, and they were able to get three crops from, uh, one, uh, from that area that, uh, under the pivot. And again, the focus on people. I know I mentioned this briefly yesterday, but Marcelo um, was a farmer who had built a school for his farmer's children to go to. Again, a strong cultural aspect. So these were the three things that I focused on. And to summarise this, I met another farmer in um, the Paso Fundo region of Brazil, the Arns family, who said to me, well, we measure our business according to our triple bottom line. I hadn't heard of this reference before. And I said, what do you mean by the triple bottom line? And they said, well, we rent land in on a 10-year basis. We can't afford to pay the highest rents, so we have to make uh, ourselves unique to anyone else that might want to take that land on. So we need to promote to anyone else, uh, to, to the landowner, when our 10-year agreement comes to end, that we are the best farmer to take on that, line, uh, that land. So the triple bottom line. Well, we all focus most definitely on the profitability, the commerciality of our businesses. And as farmers, of course, everything happens above ground. We can focus on yields, fixed costs, variable costs. It's all quantifiable. But how often uh, do we actually focus on the other two uh, issues? Environment, soil health. How often do we actually measure that? And social responsibilities. How often do we actually look at that? Because that, when you add all three of those elements together, really makes your business truly sustainable. Sustainability, of course, is a buzzword. 
And I learned this in California. This was a farm that we went to in the Central Valley. Central Valley, for those of you who don't know, is unbelievable. It's 40 to 60 miles wide, 150 miles north to south, um, 22,500 square miles in size. Over 300 crops are produced, um, w less than 1% of the total US area, yet nationally, for across the whole of the U US, it produces in value over 8% of the total US is uh, output. Incredible area. On this farm that you can see here, they were tomato producers. And he proudly said to me when we arrived, we're organic farmers, we're sustainable farmers. But I left questioning this. <laughs> Surely by monocropping and um, looking at you know, the, the images behind us, comparing to what I'd seen in Brazil, was he really, truly sustainable in the same manner in which I'd visited other farms in Brazil when they were considering their triple bottom line? This same farm hadn't actually got any business planning in place in terms of succession, or there was little interaction with, um, uh, with employees. Uh, who were mainly Mexican employed and some admittedly, openly admittedly, getting paid below uh, the current minimum wage. Uruguay was a country which I never actually anticipated going to. I was in Brazil and I was highly recommended to go, so I went. Brazil, uh, Uruguay, 60% uh, of farms, um, people own and rent land. Um, 20, a further 27% of all the land mass in Uruguay is just rented. So that's a huge propor uh, proportion of um, Uruguayan farmers that are either renting and owning or renting in, in their entirety. Of the land in Uruguay, a lot of it has seen high amounts of foreign investment from uh, Argentina and Brazil coming in. And they have a problem, soil erosion. The government are worried about this and recently have brought out new legislation. Every field parcel in Uruguay is digitally mapped. And the government agency holds enough data on each individual field parcel to do with its gradient, uh, to do with its land classification. And then a farmer, when they want to submit their cropping plan, they have to submit a, a six-year cropping plan to the same government agency. The government agency holds detail on uh, water retention rates, nitrogen fixing rates of those crops. And then the government basically says, yes or no, you can have that six-year cropping plan. But what does that mean when you then start thinking about tenancies? You have to build that, tenant, that cropping plan into those tenancies. So when a tenant is signing up to a tenancy agreement, they're signing up to that cropping plan that perhaps has already been established. But where, with any government intervention, farmers will develop means of going around it. And here you can see in those, these two images, terrace farming. So you're actively seeing on what is relatively flat land, terraces being developed. And you can see from this computer model, this is terraces being mapped out on a computer um, so that new data can be then resubmitted to the government agency now with a flat field as opposed to one that's having an gradient. The benefits being of course you're able to get a much more fluid crop rotation and then of course when that's built into a tenancy people are willing to pay higher rents. So we need to start thinking about in terms of summarizing how do we take this forward? And I think it comes down to sound business relationships. You need to get your land owner and the person that's thinking about farming the land joining their thinking together. So this can be considered as a five-point plan. First of all, you need to obviously review and take stock. What are both parties, landlord and um, uh, the tenant or the occupier, able to bring to the table? Secondly, of course, you've got to find the right match. Let's not think about the farmer or the occupier or the tenant um, as that. Let's think about the more of a land entrepreneur. And let's try and get them um, uh, bringing their objectives, their skills and their vision more aligned with that person that's wanting to own the land, that owns the land. Thirdly, of course, you need to create a balanced agreement. Both parties want to get their own return from when they're occupying the land. The landlord will, or the landowner will have a certain rental level that they're wanting to achieve back, or whether that's through a contract farming agreement, it might not be classed as a rental level. Um, but 
there needs to be certain risks attached to both parties as well. So there needs to be a discussion around that. And then what about the legal framework that sits in between? Well, many of you will be well aware of what types of legal frameworks are available. Of course, on one hand, we've got a landowner farming the land in-house. And right at the other scale, we've probably got a land entrepreneur with enough capital that he's able to actually go out and buy land and then farm it himself. But there are, of course, a lot of structures which sit in between. Long-term tenancies at one end, right the way through to contract farming agreements in the, at the other, with uh, licenses and share farming structures in between. I don't want to go too much into the detail on the legislative frameworks of those, but this gives you an uh, illustration of uh, the varying me uh, me uh, methodologies that can be used. And then, of course, what's the fifth step? In any agreement, we need to think long term. Need to think about succession. Now, I'm not necessarily saying that an agreement needs to be short term or long term, but as long as there is a clear vision between both the landowner and the occupier, then that is good thinking, good farming practice. Perhaps now, and, and of course there you can see I've brought in that diagram that you should always think about your triple bottom line and truly think about sustainability. But what about the value of the underlying asset? In the UK, land prices rose dramatically, but over the last year they have stabilised and probably have only risen approximately on average by about 1% to 2%. Let, so let's assume over a long period of time land prices continue to, to rise, as illustrated by these two arrows. The average length of a tenancy agreement in the UK is only three years. Okay, so let's think about now rolling that forward, 50 years, 55 years, 60 years. What's the implications if you only have a tenancy agreement, which is short term, on the value of the asset? Well, in my view, it's of course going to decrease if you are not thinking about that custodial role, that sustainability role as a landowner and as an occupier. So the value is going to be in that region. Now let's think about overarching longer term thinking with a shared vision, common goals and set objectives. When you have those in place, the value of the land has got to increase because you are implementing your triple bottom line, the true sustainability element. So my key take home messages the farming sector and professional advisors, and I need to stress the professional advisors, as I am one of those, need to definitely take a much more holistic approach when advising their clients, advising landowners and occupiers on the range of legal frameworks that are available to them. Let's not just think about a simple landlord and tenant relationship, but ones which are more collaborative, ones which are more flexible for both parties. I get, can't stress enough the importance of shared objectives, common goals, and a clear vision between the parties. I visited one uh, holding um, in the Netherlands where they, had, they occupied land on a very short-term basis, two years, two years, two years, two years, two years, and it had been rolling on like that. And I said, well, why doesn't your landlord just give you a longer-term agreement? And he said, well, we have a side agreement in place where those clear visions, set objectives, are encompassed within, it's not a legal framework, but every so often the landlord and that occupier review that side agreement just to make sure they're on track with what the, both parties are wanting to achieve a longer term. Uh, sorry, the triple bottom line should always be considered. Removal of unnecessary barriers. This is probably uh, with reference to the UK in terms of tax, tax legislation. But there are restrictive tax burdens on a landlord that restricts him from actually thinking longer term and letting land uh, longer term. One of those being entrepreneur's relief, which kicks in for capital gains tax. Very briefly, capital gains tax in the UK is 28%. Entrepreneur's relief reduces that to 10%. But you only get 10% as a landowner um, if you buy land and sell land that you're going to trade from. Not if you buy, uh, you've bought land and sold it and then you're going to rent it out. Relationships are absolutely king. 
And short-termism, short-term thinking is most definitely a sin, in my view, when it comes to farming. But that doesn't necessarily mean that a short-term agreement is a bad thing. Flexibility can be a business requirement. I just, sorry, I just want to leave you with one final quote, which we, as the 2016 Nuffield Scholars, might remember from Cavan. I have thought about this since throughout my Nuffield, and I think it's absolutely true. Culture will eat strategy for breakfast any day. And of course, when it's in the, the word of our industry, we should be thinking about it even more. So I just want to thank you. Um, I want to thank my Brazil Nuffield team. Um, I have, it, that has made my Nuffield experience. I've got to give a huge thank you to Sally Thompson, another Australian uh, who farms in Brazil. Um, she helped me out uh, most definitely when I went back there on my private studies. I want to thank my sponsor, the NFU Mutual Charitable Trust, and my employer, George F. White, for allowing me to have the time off work to enjoy my Nuffield experience. So thank you.